Hawkins. Half volley. Still Hawkins. Oh. What skill. Kick a goal, Royal. You deserve it. Oh. Champagne stuff. Still test in. Right on the boundary line. It's bending back. That's a magnificent effort. <laughs> Let's celebrate 250 in style. Towards the boundary line, Hawkins gathered in superbly, storms towards goal and kicks it. Willie Goal, round his body, brilliant, absolutely superb. Hawkins, the captain, left foot, and he has put it through. The Footscray Football Club has produced numerous champions over the years, but three players more than any others have caught the imagination of the Bulldog breed. Their one and only Premiership captain and coach, Charlie Sutton, the legendary Ted Whitten, and Doug Hawkins. It's no coincidence that all are great leaders, local products, and great blokes. You could imagine that a player who has a wing named after him at his home ground could afford to look down at some people around him, but that is definitely not the case with Doug Hawkins. Although no longer a drinker, Hawkins is still just as happy having a drink with some of his mates at his local pub, having a joke and a punt as ever. That he is a legend in Footscray is immaterial. And that is why the famous number seven, as much for his feats on the field, is held in awe in the western suburbs. Hawkins grew up in the tough suburb of Braybrook, a place where you either learned how to look after yourself or you didn't survive. Things were real tough and one of my great sayings was you had to learn to walk before you crawl, opposite way around. It was a good area and it was a good, a good learning process for me and for a lot of my mates as well. As has been the case in lower socio-economic areas throughout history, sport has always been a way of gaining respect and a way out. And nothing was different in the early days in Braybrook. I just wanted to play um, football at the highest level I could go, or cricket. I love my cricket as well. And um, I can always remember back in the, uh, the early days in Braybrook playing cricket out in the middle of the streets and, and football and that. But these days, you drive down through Braybrook and you, you don't see many kids that are playing footy or cricket. Things have changed a hell of a lot. But... Um, yeah, my ambition was to play footy or cricket. I mean, that, that did keep me out of a lot of trouble. And surprisingly to many, Doug Hawkins hasn't always been one of the bulldog breed. I was getting in the backyard when no one was around, had a bit of a kick myself and put up the old, the old goals and pretend you were someone else, like a lead star. Like I used to vary from North Melbourne. I used to think I was Keith Gregg a few times, running down the wing, bouncing the ball in the backyard and having a, a shot for goal. It was in these early days, playing in the shadows of the local factories, that Hawkins started to make a name for himself. And who said the Western Oval is the only place with a wing named after Dougie? Now a great friend of Hawkins, Greg Murray, used to plot his demise when coaching against the young Hawkins in his early days. We were aware of this, uh, this skinny kid from uh, Braybrook that had plenty of ability. And uh, around about that time, uh, Yarraville, who were our biggest opponents, uh, had been down to see Doug. And I can remember... Uh, the, the offer that we had to, remember he was only a kid at the stage, I think he was 15 or 16, and we had to match an offer of, uh, of Yarraville, I think their offer was a bag and uh, a pair of boots and uh, a guaranteed six games in the first under David Thorpe and 500 bucks a game. And uh, of course uh, I was uh, sent, back, uh, sent from uh, Sunshine to go and have a look at this kid and uh, he was uh, certainly one out of the box. I mean, very skinny and uh, just just a marvellous junior footballer in an era where there were just some sensational players around about that age. A lot of them uh, that Doug played with at Braybrook and uh, other sides in the area that uh, uh, kids went on to play league football. And uh, he was just uh, in a class of his own. And while players in the AFL are only now beginning to complain about the role of the tagger, Hawkins found out at a very early age that just as there are plenty of backslappers for his precocious talents, there were also plenty of head kickers looking to make a name for themselves by being the one who stopped Hawkins. The thing was you, you stop Hawkins and you win the game and uh, I was always under the impression that uh, being as skinny as he was that he might be a little bit uh, suspect to a bit of the uh, heavy stuff and uh, Albion and Braybrook in those days were just... Uh, Halcyon games, and uh, I can remember even the under 17s used to produce crowds of uh, 500 to 1,000 people. And uh, the first time we played Braybrook, I specifically said to this kid who uh, had that typical Braybrook uh, upbringing, played for Albion, and I said, Look, I think he's got a little bit of a weak tick of this kid. Give him one early, and 
if we stop him, we'll win the game. And uh, quarter time had come, and uh, Braybrook, I think, were about five goals, and we were one. And it was a very important game. We had to win the game, I think, to, uh, to uh, keep in touch with the four. And I said to this kid at quarter time, have you, uh, have you done? He said, I've hit him three times, and uh, I don't want to hit him anymore because he's hit me once, and that's enough. Hawkins remembers those games well. Playing Albion was a very, a very strong side, especially with the Geelong jumpers. Uh, and plus the grounds were always a little bit smaller, very, very tight sort of grounds where there wasn't really much room to get, a, to get around blokes or get away from blokes. Um, Albion a very tough side and, and sides like St Albans, um, very, very tough. And a lot of the guys, especially the under 13s, under 15, some of them guys looked like they were 18, 19 in a row, very well developed. The Italian boys, they're very <laughs> well developed. Especially um, the ones who pulled up to the green in cars. In cars and got up the tattoos and the earrings and stuff like that. Um, and me being a clean cut sort of boy. <laughs> yeah. Me, uh, me, <laughs> made, it, uh, made it very tough. As a good player in a side like that, uh, you would have been a target. So you would have, uh, you know, the days of coming to the AFL and not knowing what a tagger was, uh, you wouldn't have had any troubles like that, would you? Yeah, it was really strange. Cause we were getting tagged at Braybrook in those, um, you know, the early the mid 70s and. Matter of fact, it was very handy because you had Brian Wilson playing as well and, and Robert Gwinnwagon, who was a great junior footballer as well. Um, they, they got their attention too as well, so it took a little bit away from me. It was at this time that Hawkins realised that he could play the game a bit and that there might be more in this football caper than just having a kick with his mates. As well, he was beginning to enjoy success. I think I was about 15. I, I won it in a club competition um, for the local Footscray District League. Um, I knew then that you know, I wasn't going too bad, and uh, plus our club was, was a very strong club, Braybrook. I played there for eight years, and uh, we won six grand finals, a second and a third. And it was just as well the young Hawkins was getting a kick on the football ground, because he certainly was on the bench when it came to his schooling. School, mate. <laughs> School was never real flash with me. I, I'd, I'd probably go three or four days a week, mainly uh, the Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday and Friday because it was a sports day, of course, and you have your inner, inner school sort of football matches and cricket matches. And uh, Monday, I was never real flash on going to school on Monday, but I knew quite well that I'd do something in my sport and, and uh, that was going to be the way I was going to make, make a living and that's the way I've done it. Knowing that football was going to give him his only chance of achieving, Hawkins was soon being courted by a number of VFL clubs. South Melbourne approached me to go over there originally. I didn't think Footscray knew about me, but just recently I looked in a, an old uh, annual report back in 70, 76 it was, and I had a 15 year old from Braybrook, Doug Hawkins, um, a likely type. And I knew Footscray did know something about me. Um, and then all of a sudden uh, the South Melbourne thing dropped off and Footscray asked me to come down and train. As is the case with young men who have natural sporting ability, discipline and concentration was an early problem. Used to doing as he pleased, the Braybrook boys found life tough when first exposed to the rigours of the VFL. And many a good player was wasted on local football because of it. I never had a, uh, like an apprenticeship or anything like that. I mean, I just knew that football had to be my, my main go. Um, I had mates that come down here and play thirds and had to play one or two games and didn't like the training or, or didn't like being told what to do. Stuff like that and um, they couldn't handle it, they had to go back to Braybrook. But Hawkins was soon on his way at the Western Oval. Surrounded by the big names of the game, the young Hawkins had doubts about whether he could in fact mix it with the big boys. While well, he soon found out that in AFL football, no one owes anyone any favours. Matter of fact, my first week I left, I only trained for a week. I'd done the old Braybrook style again, I didn't like it. Not, not many people talked to me. It was very quiet, so I just said, I don't like this place, I'm, I'm going back to Braybrook. I went back to Braybrook and then, of course, they, they come back a week later and said, what's happening here? What are you doing? Why aren't you a trainer? I said, well, mate, I didn't like the atmosphere. No one would talk to me and, you know, I felt very lonely sort of thing. But um, once I, I started playing in the senior practice games, things changed a bit. So what my go is now, any young guy that walks in Footscray Footy Club, I'll make him feel very well because I, I know quite well what I went through. With his mind back on the job, it wasn't long before Hawkins was mixing with some of the biggest names in the game. And for a local boy from Braybrook, getting to know the legendary E.J. Witten was an experience. E.J. was a, a, a great fellow, a, a lovable fellow, a likeable bloke. I remember my, um, it would have been my second week here at the club and, and I used to wear Puma football boots. And um, being an Adidas man, E.J., general manager of Adidas, um, I remember having a kick in the rooms here and EJ walked in and, and roared, get those boots off, what are you doing with those boots on? I didn't know who he was talking to, I looked around, looked behind me and see who he was talking to. And, 
And uh, he walked over, you, Doug, what are you doing with those boots on? You can't wear them here. We're at it at. So um, the next night at train, then come EJ with the two brand new pair of footy boots. I thought it was fantastic. Doug, when he first arrived, was just a very, very light, very skinny boy, but oozed a lot of talent. Did he use a bit of confidence as well? Oh, he certainly had confidence on the football field. Uh, he took his time to uh, adjust to the changing room situation, but has certainly uh, become a, uh, a very competent man in there at the moment. But uh, in terms of confidence on the ground, he always had it because he has got a tremendous amount of ability and rightfully so confidence in that ability. Once accepted, some of the old problems started to resurface. Being a young fella, probably coming from Bray Rock, everything being your own way in junior football. Um, you know, a few bounces, run around blokes, kicked a couple of goals. You know, things were, were fairly, I might say easy, were, were a little bit easier. And all of a sudden you come here and you go for a mark and you miss it and you say, oh, well, I'll get the next one. You just can't do that. And um, I was doing that, especially in my early days. You know, I'd still, I still played 18 games my first year and, and um, my second year I think I got 22. But there was a few times I had the six or seven games in a row in the seconds. Was it hard to handle the success being the only one or two blokes from the local area who were playing for the the gun side, Footscray and the VFL and, and all the, the hype that goes with it. But you were the young bloke who just come up, you used to catch the bus to yeah. the, the training. It was pretty hard, mate, yeah, especially um, back at Brave, you know, you go back to the Brave Footy Club, watch, watch the games there and people come up shaking your hand, patting you on the back and you start thinking you're a little bit better than you probably are. You know, you get that false security about yourself. Um, I'm sure that happened to me in my early days, you know, you start thinking you're a little bit better than you are. Um, but you quickly come back to earth. You know, once you start playing a few bad games and you find yourself in the seconds and, and all of a sudden the people are patting on the back, ain't patting on the back anymore. Um, they're sort of dropped off here a bit. But um, that was very tough to handle, especially, you know, being 17, 18 and a fair bit of money in your hand, you know. It was pretty easy to waste your money when you were young. Hawkins was soon in the thick of things and it wasn't long before the football world found out what the Footscray area had known for years and that was there was someone special on Footscray's wing. Clever, elusive, highly skilled, fair and courageous and deadly near the goals. Everything you could hope for and everything he admired about his childhood idol, Keith Gregg, the man he lined up on in his first AFL game. It was probably one of the greatest thrills of my life. Um, always been my boy, boyhood idol and, and uh, superstar player, Keith Gregg was. And um, I couldn't believe when they said, oh, you're playing a wing this week, you're playing North Melbourne. I, I didn't know if I'd play on Keith Gregg or who to be. I ran out in the wing and there was Keith Gregg lined up next to me, shook hands and I had that little shaky feeling in my body. <laughs> it was unbelievable. As I said, I followed North Melbourne and I used to get out in the outer wing at North Melbourne and watch Keith Gregg play and, and watch him do his stuff. And all of a sudden, there I am playing against a bloke I always loved and admired. Um, no, I didn't, you know, I, I knew he was a ball player and I'm, I classed myself as a ball player. And, but, um, yeah, think, it was just a great feeling to play against a bloke who you admired all your life sort of thing. But how things changed between his first game and his second. For a start, his coach Bill Goggin called it quits. And talk about extremes, Hawkins went from playing on dual Brownlow medalist Keith Gregg to taking on St Kilda's Robbie Mad Dog Muir, one of the roughest, toughest players ever to play, all within a week. He walked up and, and shook my hand and said, listen son, you get a kick, I'm going to kill you. And I looked at his eyes and his eyes were red, this red raw. I, I just... <laughs> Well, the other wingman, the other wingman Footscray at that stage was Mick Kelly. I said to Mick, this, this change wings, and Mick said, no, nah, son, you'll be right. It's a good learning process for you. It was all such an adventure. Even off the ground, things were getting bigger and better. For one, money wasn't a problem all of a sudden. Not when you're a star league footballer. Footscray finance man and close friend Stephen Smith talks of one of his first associations with the Hawk. When we first met, it was a bit indifferent. He rang me up and... Uh... You know, it was my first day at the club and said, oh, you don't know me yet, but I need a couple of grand for uh, the panel van and to move into a new pad. So that was the first uh, words I spoke with Doug and, you know, ever since we've sort of got on this very well. I always liked a bit of a bet. I'm always a bit of a punt man and uh, all my mates from Braver were a bit of punters and uh, I can always remember the, uh, the uh, it was like, a, like going to church. It was a Monday night. We always used to go to the Greyhounds in the back of my panel van. We always, all the boys from Braver could jump in the back of the, back of the panel van and... We'd go out to the Greyhounds and we'd have our fair share of a few beers in the, in the, in the bar downstairs and, and uh, have our bets. And uh, as I said, with the money, you know, being young coming in, it was pretty easy to waste it. Um, they were good times, <laughs> very good times, matter of fact. And, uh, well, the females, mate, well, you know. <laughs> when you're young and fit, you can get away with a bit, but not when you're famous. 
pub fights, girls and boozing, well, you can get away with them in Braybrook, but not under the bright lights of Melbourne nightclubs. I always loved the beer and I never, you know, never, we couldn't say I never did love a beer, I always loved the drink. And uh, I got to a stage where I was probably having a few drinks too many and, and I didn't care who seen me, I didn't realise that you know, Dave Hawkins might have been someone that people looked up to or, or, or thought highly of. And uh, sure, I was, I was probably a target a few times. But, um, I mean, I mean, that was part of life as well. That was part of growing up and that was part of learning, learning the ropes. But these were only minor problems. And anyway, most were easily laughed off. And still more was to come as Footscray, under the coaching of Michael Malthouse, came good in 1985. What a year. A best and fairest for Hawkins, a century of goals and a Coleman medal for full forward Simon Beasley, a Brownlow medal for recruit Brad Hardy, and Footscray in the finals for the first time in nine years, finishing second on the ladder behind Essendon. It was a, a year that I'd probably never forget the rest of my footy career at Footscray, wherever I ended up going to play after it. Um, um, Brad Hardy won the Brownlow medal in 85. You know, his first year was just sensational. Simon Boothley, well, a lot of people didn't give Simon a lot of credit. He was a very tough player. And um, Simon has been a great player for Footscray and a great clubman too. You know, he was very loyal. Um, that, was, that was the best year of my football since I've been at Footscray. And, you know, just playing in finals was just, just the, the feeling of you hear about, you know, people talk to you about playing in the finals. You know, you run out in the ground, there's 50, 60, 70,000 people roaring and yelling. It was a great experience. The Bulldogs had plenty of bite as they stormed into the preliminary final against Hawthorne after beating North Melbourne in the first semi-final. The Dogs had lost the qualifying final to the Hawks by a massive 93 points. Yet at three-quarter time in the preliminary final, the Bulldogs trailed by just one point in their bid to play off for the flag against Essendon. Well, Beasley would be about uh, 35 to 40 metres out on a 45 degree angle. And of course, this goal will make scores dead level. And that is a goal. And that's Beasley's first. And scores dead level. I think it's so much height as uh, not quite checking. McLean, that's a goal. Puts their lead by six points. His first goal. Great snap shot. Coming out to Edmonds. Edmonds kick is up there towards Beasley and Mute. Bad. He's got it, Beasley. There she is on its way. Oh, that's a long kick, and what a goal by the captain. Back to Royal, plenty of time. Has a long shot of goal. Beasley and New. Goal! Oh, what a kick! Great play, foot play. Gets around Wallace and Deepy and Domenico. Short to half forward. That was Beasley from only 20 metres out. It's a goal. Footscray lead by nine points in the preliminary final. It's down to Russo. His hand pass is not a good one, though. Peart clears it to Footscray up towards the half-back line. Lovely tackle, Mark. Picked up by Daniel Footscray going back into attack. A pass and so it's got it. There she is on its way. Will it come around enough? It does. It would have won make the distance. Or is it a goal? Let's see on the result. It's a goal. Footscray skipper wobbles the punch kick up the half-forward. Oh, Royal, yes. Tipped in beautifully in front of ears. Out to Hawkins on his own. Dickie to go a long way from his opponent. And only about, uh, well, 30 metres out. No reason he couldn't kick it, and he has the goal, and by it doesn't move. So Hawkins puts through his first goal for Footscray. The sisters over it goes to Hardy. Hardy's grab. Oh, great play. Brilliant play. He better kick it. He's clear now. A hand pass coming over now to uh, Royal. Royal with another long hand pass over to Edmund. This could be a goal, a long shot it is. And Footscray is at the front. Puts it high, up towards half forward. Beasley, great mark. From this kick about uh, 35 metres out directly in front. Taking plenty of time, there she is on its way. And uh, let's see the result. It's a goal. See the ball marked here by Kennedy, not wasting any time. Looking for Beasley and Hugh having a great battle down there. Neither can take the mark. Going into an open goal, it's perfect. Has the ball to ground, but it's picked up by Bamford. Gives it out to McLean. Quickstone not done yet. Here's Royal. He'll put this one through as well. He fires, shoots, and that's another one to put spray, so two quick goals. In a sensational last quarter, Hawthorne, inspired by their captain Lee Matthews, held on to win by 10 points. A case of so near for Footscray after a magnificent year, but soon Hawken realised it had all come to naught.
gee, that was disappointing. Um, it probably didn't really su didn't really sink into me until probably uh, Sunday lunchtime that we're only ten points away from playing the grand final. I thought that stage, you know, what a great effort, you know, because I've never played final. I thought foot's great. What a great effort making the preliminary final of all things, just making the preliminary final. And then I, you know, we and then I Sunday afternoon sort of sunk in and went down watch Wurry, well, not Wurry, Williamstown playing the grand final, and they were having a few quiet beers again on the Sunday, and I just started to sink into me that we're only ten points away from playing the grand final against Essendon. So I thought, you know, played a, a great, played a great, they played very well in the grand final that day. But I thought that, you know, Footscray played well against Essendon and, and, you know, I thought we could have done all right. But gee whiz, 10 points. Unbelievable. For the first time in his life, Hawkins went to the MCG to watch the grand final with the empty feeling in his stomach that he so easily could have been out there instead of just watching from the stands. I, I matter of fact, I had a few quiet beers early before we got there, just to relax a bit, you know, it was... It was very tough. Um, just, just the feeling of knowing not being out there. Where, you know, I mean, it could never happen again. Who knows? You know. Still in football, there is always next year, and understandably, Hawkins looked towards 1986 with tremendous anticipation. And why not? He'd just produced the best year of his career. He was playing in a team capable of mixing it with anyone. He was in the prime of his life. Then suddenly, you know, it was a good year. We're going along pretty well, and all of a sudden, bang, knee injury. Um, you know, 26 year old, footy career could be over, may never play again. Um, that just really, just really showed me how much football really meant to me. You know, I, I was just sort of rolling along. Things would come along easy, you know, having a game of footy, you know, playing all right. Life was great. And then, then whack. Big shock. What was the first thing that went through your mind when you did your knee in that wing? Well, I, I, I really thought I broke my leg. Tony Shaw sort of dived across on the ball and hit my leg. I thought I broke my, broke my leg. Um, until I got to see the surgeon that night and he said, oh, I think you've, you've done your milieu ligament, which was only you know, a couple of months out. And then when, once I'd done the, uh, the orthoscope, it showed that I'd done my anterior cruciate medial ligament, plus I'd done, pom done my posterior cruciate about four years before that. So I've done the whole lot. And then he, uh, just before the operation, um, David Young, who was, who was a surgeon, said to me that you may never play again. You know, that's how bad your leg was. I said, 26 year old, I'll never play footy again. I mean, that's my life. I mean, I've got to play footy. And um, it just really showed me how much football really meant to me. The knee injury sparked off the toughest six months of Doug Hawkins' life. A time where Hawkins had to, for the first time, face up to reality and hard work. And a time where his talents as a sportsman, his closest companion through the tough times, may well have been snatched away from him. Suddenly, Doug Hawkins, the superstar, was poor Dougie with the bad knee. And with his spirits down, Hawkins' life hit the skids. Life after the operation was, was very tough. You know, I, was, I got to a stage where I was very depressed. Um, led to a lot of very uh, lengthy drinking bouts. You know, it got to a stage where I was just drinking a hell of a lot, um, just from mainly through depression and, and feeling sorry for myself, probably. Um, plus my punting. You know, I wasn't working. I lost my job. I, had, I was driving a truck for a local firm called Kinnears Ropes up in Ballot Road. Um, it was a great job, I really enjoyed it. And all of a sudden that was gone, I had to sell my truck, had no, no work. Um, the first three months was just, was just unbelievable. You know, um, uh, the fiance left me as well, she took off, and um, mainly due to my, my, my you know, drinking and late nights and stuff like that. It was just very tough, it was just, I don't know if any other guys have gone through this thing as well, but geez, it was tough. Three months just, just all just went away, you know. All I had was my, um, Probably, you know, my, I called my mates, you know, my drinking mates and my punting mates, and they were always going to be there. Um, yeah, the whole world just fell apart. It was, it was amazing. And then, plus, when you come out of the operation, you, you can't bend your leg. You think, Jesus, I'm never going to play again. You know, maybe they're right. As bad as it all seemed at the time, Hawkins looks back at that time as one of growing up and of great learning. That ninja really made me sort of think about my football more, and, it, and it's helped me as a, as a person too, I think to go through the, you know, the downers of things. You, know, you read about players having knee injuries and you say to yourself, well, if it won't happen to me, I'll be right. I'll play for 10, 15 years and, and have no troubles. But um, geez, a lot of guys gone through hell mate, with knee injuries. It's unbelievable. With a knee ligament held together synthetically and doubt still in his mind, Hawkins came back. And with his beloved Footscray Guernsey on his back, he headed towards his wing in one of the most emotional comebacks seen in football. 
I was a little bit, little bit overweight. <laughs> I was about two stone overweight. Geez, I was fat. Oh, I was terrible. Um, it was a great, a great buzz, you know. Um, I remember I come on in the second quarter and I can remember Steve McPherson was having a shot for goal and Steve looked around and wondered what the big roar was about, you know, thinking it was him kicking the goal. But it was uh, me coming onto the ground. I can remember just sort of running across the ground. I, I think I floated across to the outer wing and took my position up again on the outer wing. It was just a, a great buzz. And I think, matter of fact, it's the only time we've ever beaten the Eagles with that game. So it's going to be in my mind for a long time. And come back he did. Like all champions, Hawkins was able to fight back from adversity and relaunch his career. A career that still faced crisis and fulfilled ambition. When you're part of the elite of football, the highest honour the game of Australian rules can bestow is to be selected to represent your state. And in Hawkins' case, the chance to wear the big V of Victoria was a dream come true. It was just a great feeling, just the atmosphere of being involved with, with Teddy Whitten and, and the Ron Brashies and these sort of things. It was just, it was just amazing. Um, you chuck the big V on a train and, you know, for the first time and you know, I'd run around like Simon Madden, six foot eight or nine. You just felt so big and strong and just so proud to wear it. It gave Hawkins a chance to enjoy the game at its rarefied best. I can remember at training the first, well, the first time in 82, I believe we, we, had, we had circle work. I reckon the ball hit the ground twice. <laughs> like at your own local, I mean, I say local club, but your own VFL club, it hit the ball, you know, 10, 20 times maybe. But this, this, this night at training, the Victorian squad hit the ball twice, hit the ground. I just couldn't believe it. You know, the school level of the play was just unbelievable. We had a couple of wins in South Australia, which was very tough going over there. Um, you know, 40,000 Croatians wanting to kick a, Vic, kick a Vic and stuff like that. Teddy Whitten got us, you know, really together as a, as a unit. As you said, it was very hard because, you know, the next Saturday you might be playing against the same bloke your, your team, you know, just trying to do a shepherd for and stuff like that. But after the game, we all got together and, and we really um, did enjoy our victories. The day after the end of the 1990 Grand Final, Footscray held their best and fairest count at the Cadillac Bar nightclub in Carlton, where Terry Wallace was named the club champion. But it was here that news first broke that the Footscray Football Club would be no more, that a deal had been made with the Fitzroy Football Club to merge the two teams and become the Fitzroy Bulldogs. The deal, heavily weighted towards the Lions, was virtually a takeover. Dougie's wing, his beloved Bulldogs, and a history that he was a proud member of was no more. When I first heard the news, I was, I was just devastated, you know. I was, I was at the stage I was just going to retire and just give football completely away. You know, I was just so devastated from it. Um, then when I sat down and had a, a good think about it, you know, I spoke to the wife, Raylan, and, and uh, looked at the future, you know. I said, well, you know, you've got to go along with these things. You know, football's changed. Things have changed. It's like a business. If you, if you can't run a business, well, you know, you're going to be out of it, aren't you, really? But showing fight that many believed did not exist in the western suburbs, the Bulldog bit back. And after a magnificent community fundraising campaign and corporate sponsorship from the local area, Footscray survived. And the man they asked to lead the team in its battle for survival, Doug Hawkins. You read of 80 year old people sitting on corners at lights, rattling tins and that. You know, some of them couldn't walk, so they sat in there in chairs or wheelchairs and that. And that was amazing. Kids at eight or nine year olds smashing their money box open to, to give the, to the club, I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable. Some of these people come here at six or seven o'clock in the morning to, to get their front seat at Western Oval. You know, I remember I used to live across the road and I'd be driving the milk bar to get the, the paper and that, and there they are all, all lined up and queued up. It's amazing what it, what it meant to them. All the people just supporting, supporting the players as well. I mean, it was, you know, I think it did to the players realise that you know, there's more to just us playing football. There's the people out there who's paying to get in and stand out there in the rain and that, well, we're playing in the rain. You know, we're their heroes and they look up to us. I think Doug over the years has come to epitomise the, the Footscray Football Club and the Western Suburbs and uh, I think that's a, an accolade to Doug that he has earned and rightfully earned and he should be very proud of it and I'm sure he is. I mean, just look over here and have a sign that says the Doug Hawkins wing. I think that's a tremendous uh, gesture to the man. His stand in the in the fight for our survival was very, very significant and uh, he was a, a figurehead for the on-field performance of the club that was recognised and appreciated by many, many people. Coaches have not always had a happy life out at the Western Oval and Hawkins has played under six in his time there. His first, Billy Goggin. Billy Goggin was a great footballer, I really admired his football ability. I didn't know, you know Billy that well, but um, every, every time he spoke I just sort of stared at him and looked at him. You know, he, you know, just from his reputation of, of, of Billy Goggin. Um, 
he was a nice bloke, Billy, and you know, as I said, it was very hard to, to judge him as a coach. Going to him for one one game, and he left. Then Don McKenzie. Donny was a great thinker, a real, a real football brain. Um, nice fella too, good bloke. Um, Western Suburbs boy, he played football at Sunshine and that VFA, won a list of medal. Um, he was he was a good coach, Don. He was very good. Former Richmond champion Royce Hart. Being a North Melbourne supporter, I used to go to the finals and watch North and Richmond in the finals, and Royce Hart would be kicking those 60 yarder goals. Used to make me sick. I used to hate him. <laughs> used to hate him. Let Royce Hart, someone build him, please. Um, Great player. Um, Coach-wise, well, you know, he, he tried very hard here. You know, I, I think he'd done a great job with Carlton Templeton, Templeton in 1980. Won the Brownlow medal in St. R. Ford, and I think Royce had a lot to do with that too. Teammate turned coach Ian Bluey Hampshire. One, one minute your, your teammate having a few beers, you're in a bit of a joke, and then all of a sudden he's in charge, giving your orders. Um, yeah, well, he's, well, Bluey was great. He was a fantastic fella. Um, um, he was tough, you know, he played his footy tough. You know, he, he laid the law too when he was a coach. He was a good coach. He was very tough and very straight, very honest. No, no rubbish about Bluey. He was straight down the line. The tough, no-nonsense, Michael Malthouse. I always remember our first trip under Mick. It was over to Western Australia. We played uh, Swan Districts over at Collie, a place called Collie in Western Australia. And uh, on the way back, I remember Mick laying the law down by saying, there'll be no drinking on the plane coming back. And uh, Butchie Edwards. Another good, another mate of mine and character, would he? We decided to test Mickey out. We had a couple of beers on the way back, and of course, the next week we we're in the seconds. So I knew, I knew straight away that uh, Mick Monis was, was a bloke that would take no, no rubbish from you. And now a former teammate, Terry Wheeler. Now he's done a great job at Footscray, and um, his communication with, with every player, you know, from the captain down to the, to the under-19s, is just spot on. You know, he'll talk to anybody, and he'll listen to you as well. Um, you know, he's been good for Footscray, and uh, I think he's, he's doing a great job. Doug Hawkins has got a habit of giving the men in white a hard time, whether trying to bluff them for a free kick or just disputing a decision. No one could accuse Doug Hawkins of being backward when it comes to going forward. But once, he pushed the umpire just that little bit too far. I got reported one day by Johnny Russo for um, giving the two-fingered gesture to him. All I was trying to tell him, and, it was, and, it, and it was, I was being honest there, that the boy hit my arm and the guy behind me marked and he gave me, paid the mark and I was just trying to tell him hit my arm and he, gave me, he reported me for giving the two finger, <laughs> two finger gesture but gee whiz, I got out that one, I was very lucky. And what about his other indiscretions? My first appearance was um, after seven or eight years of playing league football, I got three weeks for, for punching Chris Connolly. Bit of a tap over the head, you know, he got straight back up, he was a pretty tough kid too Chris, matter of fact. Greg Burns cleaned me up. He's a very tough character too. He's a trotting driver, I think. Yeah, now. Ballarat boy. Very strong forearms. Very strong forearms. And I, I caught one of his forearms one day, and I um, remember the uh, the lights went out for about 10, 20 seconds. I was, it was very dark there. I, I jumped to my feet and said to myself, "The first thing, cooler bloke I see if the footy's going to cop it is my old mate Mickey Roberts <laughs> coming down the wing in front of the grandstand, bouncing the ball, and he had one bounce too many, and." Uh, the old forearm accidentally hit him in the jaw and spit his mouth open his nose. And but anyway, we got to the tribunal and, and Mick said to me, you know, gee, Hawk, I, I couldn't believe you did that to me. I said, mate, I thought you were Greg Burns. <laughs> so having seen football in three decades, the 70s, the 80s and the 90s in the top league, who does Hawkins rate as his toughest opponents? Gee, Keith Greg was great, even though he was my idol. You know, he was, he was a great player and he was very tough to play on. As a matter of fact, I got Keith Gregg after his knee injuries. I'd hate to play on him in the mid-70s when he was flying. It'd be very hard to play on. Yeah. Wayne Shimbush was a great player. Shimmer was always tough. He's a, a player who can go both ways, you know, defend and attack. Never give up. You know, just never gives up. You know, Robert Flower. Gee whiz, how can you say much about Robert Flower? He was a great player, you know, built very lightly built, but um, courageous. Oh, he was a great player, Robert Flower. He always, you know, Victorian side, you always, Robert Flower was always the first one picked and probably, you know, best player on most occasions. A great, you know, a big occasion player. I'd like to see him play in the finals. If Melbourne played finals, he would have been sensational. Um, you know, look at Dipper. Dipper was a, a great, you know, for a bloke of his size and built playing on the wing for many years. Amazing. You know, just so tough and, and full of character. Jeff Cunningham, St Kilda. Old Joffe, he was very tough and, you know, a bloke who I, you know, didn't have a, a hell of a lot, or he had a lot of ability, but just, just the will to, to do well and his toughness. 
he was, he, was a, he was a very tough player, Joffer, and Merv Nagel was another one that come to mind. And then you look at Ricky Barham, Mickey Turner. I mean, geez, it was a great, a great era of, of wingmen in those days. Hawkins rates 1980 Brownlow medalist Kelvin Templeton as his most talented teammate. The year he won the medal in 1980 was just out of this world. He was sensational. I remember one game we played saying cool about here, and I think he had 25 kicks, 16 marks, 15 handballs, and kicked six goals, four or something from centre four. Um, he was sensational, Templeton. Um, behind him, very closely, follows another little fellow, Brian Royal. I mean, Chico Royal's been a great player for Footscray. He's probably um, never finished out of the first three in the best and first he's been at the club, which I think speaks for itself. And, um, you know, he's, he was always, you know, Victorian size, always one of the first picked from Footscray. Um, especially uh, 84, 85, he's probably the best rover in Australia at that stage. I, I class him that way. Dale Waitman wasn't, you know, they were very similar type players. Um, you know, you, then you got your Brad Hardy. Brad was a great player and he played for a year and two years. You know, first year winning the Brownlow medal was fantastic, so um, he was a great player, Brad. Andrew Purser, you know, Ruckman, who was six foot three, rucked non stop most games, never hardly had a rest. He'd done it for about six years. And his best players of all time. Keith Gregg again, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a North man. I'm going to say Malcolm Blight because he was a he was a great player as well. He had that that special ability to do something when the, the games are tight. He do something special. We'll take that big high mark or kick the goal on the left foot, run down the boundary, and then get dragged by Ron Brassy <laughs> for doing it. <laughs> um, you know, that was sort of players you know that come to mind very quickly. And what does his peers think of Hawkins himself? Dougie Hawkins is a real character. The AFL, I suppose you call him, and. Uh, you know, he's been a great player for Footscray, uh, one of the best ever, I think, for Footscray. So, um, great character, great for the game, and, you know, as I said, he's got the ability to match it too. It'd be pretty hard to leave someone like Dougie out of your best, probably your best team, because uh, he's been a great player, you know, for Footscray, and uh, played a lot of great games, and I suppose the consistency there with him just shows, and uh, he's a very clever player, you know, very quick mover. He, uh, he's a different type of player to a lot of others. He's got very good hand ball coordination, like he's very good with his hands and that, and, um, and uh, reads the game very well. But he's been a, a great uh, player, you know, like for Footscray over the years. And, and I think that, uh, you know, even to come back after a severe knee like he's had, he's had a few ups and downs and that in his time. But, uh, you know, to take on the captaincy and to be playing as well as he is at the moment, been a bit of a feather in his cap, I think. Despite or because of his knockabout nature, his love of a beer over the years and a good laugh, everyone has a story about Doug Hawkins, like the time he fell asleep ringing Japan and woke up with a $3,000 phone bill. Doug used to uh, like getting out on the, uh, on the uh, grog on a Saturday night. and On the Sunday morning, religiously, it didn't matter what time he got home, he uh, would always take his dogs for a walk. The dogs were uh, just number one priority on a Sunday morning. It didn't make any difference uh, who else was there. The dogs had to go for a walk. He took the dogs down for a walk to the creek one morning and uh, he'd obviously only been home about half an hour and they, uh, the dogs had sort of taken Doug for a walk and they got a little bit close to the edge and the dogs jumped in the creek and of course Doug either had the leads wrapped around his arm but he went in after them and if you could imagine Doug trying to get out and the dogs going back into the water and he's thinking or the dogs are thinking that he's playing and all the time they're taking him under the water and this is a true story I mean uh, the way he tells it that he's coming up for, uh, for uh, a breath for the third time and it uh, was just so funny and, and, and during the course of it I think he lost his uh, his uh, jocks, so he ended up having to make his way home in the early hours of the morning uh, with a belly full of creek water and uh, no jocks on to get back home. Uh, the night before his wedding he, he come down and stayed at our place and I was supposed to be looking after him but it didn't do too good a job. We sort of got to bed at five o'clock, he locked his car keys in the, in the car to get to the wedding the next day and the RACV bloke didn't know he was so he wouldn't open the car so it was only we had a newspaper clipping of him you know, he's getting married that, that sort of recognised him, but he didn't sort of look like the picture that morning. The Doug Hawkins story that I'm very proud about is, is his work 
that he does do now at the Western General Hospital where he works. Uh, Doug is employed there in, um, in, in the goods area, delivery area, whatever, but the work he does with the patients, I think, is, is a tremendous uh, amount of work that he does for those people. And so the story that I like about Doug Hawkins is that Doug Hawkins the man, Doug Hawkins the person who spends so much of his own personal time sharing it around with other people, and his job at the Western General Hospital is a fine example of that. And of course, there have been plenty of teammates and opponents who have made Hawkins' gap tooth grin break across his face. Crackers Coonan was always very strange, very funny. Um, I, remember, I remember one day, it was, it was, matter of fact, it was my first night game, and we were playing out at Waverley against North Melbourne again. It was strange, I played against North Melbourne all the time. And, and I remember having, I think it was my second or third kick, and there was Crackers Coonan on my mark. You kick this, you little mongrel, scrawny little mongrel, and I'll kill you. I'm going to knock your head off and all this sort of thing. He had no teeth. And he was pretty <laughs> ugly too, and he's not, he's not real flash. He's not, pretty he's, not, he's, not, he's not real pretty, and I hope he doesn't mind me saying it, but <laughs> he's not real good looking. And there I am, a 17 year old, you know, will I kick this goal? You know, put foot scrape one goal in front, or will I miss it so, or crack, then crackers won't belt me head off? <laughs> what will I do? So I just put the head down and aimed and went straight through. So you come and catch me, crackers, come and catch me. <laughs> with Dipper, we've had some great battles with Dipper. and. And um, you know, he's been a great player for Hawthorne for years and years and years. And um, when I say battles, I mean just tough things, but just tough, just a tough player. And then after the game, we always shake hands and have a quiet drink together. And that. What about around the club? Uh, it must have been strange for such a working-class club like Footscray to have a guy like Simon Beasley coming in in his pinstripe suit every, <laughs> suit every day from the stock market. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a, when he first arrived, he came in with the suit, and I thought, "Geez, this bloke, he, he won't, he won't get along with these fellas, us fellas out here. <laughs> He's not going to make it, this bloke, Simon Beasley." But gee, um, all of a sudden, he, he just showed he had that bit of character about him, um, charisma. He was, he was a he mixed in so well from the word go, you know, he was, he was a joker, he loved a joke and um, loved a bit of a punt. Um, drinker, well, never, never was a real drinker, but he, he mixed in from the word go, he was fabulous. I think he, I think he, where did he come from Western Australia? I think yeah, it was Swan District. Swan District, so that was probably a pretty tough sort of area too. Um, yeah, the old striped pinstripe suit when he first walked in, I couldn't believe it. But he done very well, he mixed in, mixed in very well. So now Hawkins has realised time is catching up. He's given up the beer, married with a family, and dedication is no longer a chore, but a natural reaction. He has lost a stone and a half, but in true Hawkins tradition, his last drink was a beauty. Was there any one uh, incident that maybe helped you decide to get off the grog? <laughs> I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> uh, it was my old mate, Terry Wallace. and um, Terry Wallace, geez, uh, talking about plays, he was a great player, Terry Wallace. I mean, best in the and premierships and... He's a good drinker too, Terry was. <laughs> he took me out, he took me out. We went out to the races one, one day, went out to Sandown on a Tuesday and we had a few drinks and went to a sportsman's night that night on the Tuesday night. Met Brad Hardy there and we'd done a sportsman's night and then we went into the Chevron and, and had, another, had a few quiet drinks there and end up, end up waking up in this bus out, out at Cheltenham. <laughs> so anyway, I, was, I, was, I, had a, I had the night off because it was our break up, you know, the annual break up after the end of the year, you have that bit of a night out. Anyway, that on the Wednesday morning, Terry decides he wants to go to Seymour races. I said, listen, mate, I've got to go home. I can't be going to Seymour races. Anyway, nine o'clock down the Hume Highway, there we go in this bus <laughs> to Seymour races. <laughs> no, I'm on it. I couldn't believe I was on it. I, think I, I wanted to go home. But anyway, we, we had a good day at the races again, and I got home on Thursday. <laughs> I got home Thursday, two days later. And uh, I went home, got in bed, and I said to myself, I'm not drinking no more. <laughs> I'm yeah. giving it away. And, I've never had a beer since. Like everyone, Hawkins has settled down. He's married to Raylene and with a young daughter has found joys he never dreamed of as a young knockabout. A lot of people tell you about when you get married, your life changes. I mean, that's, that's true. When you have a baby, your life changes again. And uh, in my case, for the good, you know, as I said, I've always been a pretty wild sort of boy and a bit erratic. And uh, being married and having a family, mate, it's responsibility's been, I, mean, I love it. You know, going home, your little girl, meeting you at the door, daddy, 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 I mean, it's fantastic. And uh, my wife's been a great support. I'm, I'm pretty sure without her support, where could Doug Hawkins be now? Who knows, you know? I was on the, you know, I was going pretty, living life pretty full and very fast. Um, but she's been a great help too. He's a great guy. He's a, he's a legend. 
and uh, his um, his ability for uh, to be loved by everybody is just amazing. I mean, he's he's a rogue, he's a villain. The deal with Doug has just been, you know, fantastic. I think he's his greatest assets, not only his great football skills, obviously, is he the fact that he can mix with people at all levels within the club and the mail we've got in the files over the year from you know from kids he's visited in hospital to the elderly people and that have just been tremendous and a lot of people probably wouldn't realise what he's done for everyone out in the west uh, over his career. He's a fine example for many of the, the, the boys who live within our area of uh, if you're able to knuckle down and do some work and make the most of what the talents you're given you can do well. I mean. Uh, Doug has been blessed with God-given talents in the football area and he's utilised them to the, to the utmost and I think that's a credit to him and it is an example that is quite easily followed by many, many other people from out the western suburbs. Well, Doug Hawkins certainly hasn't been a saint, but he's been a great bloke. Hawkins has enjoyed life to the full, but at the same time brought untold joy to people's lives by signing an autograph, visiting someone in hospital, having a beer and a chat, or by doing what he does best and what he'll always be remembered for, producing pure magic in the red, white and blue on the Doug Hawkins wing. I've lived life to the fullest, you know, as you said, I've had some great time, you know, been up there and time's been down there. Um, I wouldn't change many things. Um, maybe a little bit when I was a bit younger, you know, straighten myself out a little bit earlier. But, um, mate, I've, I've had a good life. I can't complain. I've been, been to hell and back and survived it, so I'll go again and I'll get through it. I won't be going again, mate, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> Battles on, Liberatore, clever hand pass to Hawkins, 25 metres out, have they got their first? Yes, they have. Leads the hand pass away, Hawkins after it again, Dougie Hawkins, how do you like that? Drops oh. a little bit short, Whitney, but gee, that would have been spectacular. Hawkins has dropped it. The kick off the side of Colin Hughes left foot. Good gather by Hawkins, coming back into some form. Dougie Hawkins could score from here. Drop punt kick is there. Bulldog nail in the coffin. Baxter goes for a longer kick this time. Oh, Hawkins, what a mark! Back to Bradley. Long to half forward flank. Hawkins again. Now Keith had to beat about three opponents. Now can Hawkins do something? The Hawk, the skipper, has gold, brings a smile to his face. Has to try to beat two of them. At the Hawkins. Hawkins onto the left foot and goal. On the bounce to Hawkins. 55 metres out. He unloads a big one. It's there. Badly injured. Not playing again this year. And there's a great piece of play by Dougie Hawkins. Towards the boundary line. Hawkins gathered in superbly. Storms towards goal and kicks it.